evening, brethren. If you are visiting with us this evening, thank you for being our honored guests. Please take one of the cards from the back of the pew in front of you, fill it out. Just leave it in the pew. We'd like to have a record that you were here. We have several announcements we need to get to before we begin our worship service tonight concerning our sick ones and various others. Sister Carla Sorrell is slated to have, uh, I believe it's rotator cuff repair and some other things with one of her shoulders tomorrow at Resurgence Clinic here in Fayetteville, as I understand it. Okay, it's the one over at Morrow. At 8 o'clock, 10 o'clock. Okay, going in at 8 o'clock for surgery at 10. Now we've got the scoop. So do keep Carla in your prayers. That will be at the facility over uh, South Lake, you said? South Lake Mall. South Lake Mall, okay. Ray Cozart is slated for hip replacement surgery next month. And I think he's almost to the point of can't hardly wait. So we'll keep him in prayer. Uh, Sister Joanne Trawick, Sister Judy Beckwith, both are recuperating at home. We had a note from Joanne this week. She's doing better. Both of them have suffered uh, broken arms and bumps and bruises in the last few weeks. Uh, Ken Loy Walker in Jamaica continues treatment for uh, chemotherapy for cancer, for stomach cancer, esophageal cancer. And Fred Mack, Andy and Linda Johnson's 89-year-old neighbor that they kind of look after, has come home from rehab, but now he's got uh, a C. diff infection that they're having to deal with, so keep him in your prayers. Jewel Green is at home tonight, not feeling well. She's had a migraine, I believe, today. Keep in your prayers Paul Lyons and Brenda Mitchell, both recuperating after surgery, both doing well at last report. Upcoming activities this Friday morning at 10, weather permitting, we'll have a yard work day for anybody who can come. If you would like to do some of the, the work in the yard, plantings and trimmings and things like that, but you can't come Friday, if you'll talk to Jim Scoma, he'll lay out some things that need to be done and you can do it on your own schedule. Today is Camp Inagahee's Heart of the Matter Drive. If you would like to contribute to that you can see Greg or any of the elders and give a, a, a contribution to them for that. The area-wide youth devotional will be next Sunday evening at the Atlanta Airport area congregation at 5. Uh, Silver Wings, our 2018 potluck and planning session will be Friday, February 16th at 6.30. That's the last date I had. Is that still current? I'll assume that it is. CYC begins in two weeks, February 23rd, 24th, 25th. And the progressive meeting, Brother Vance Hutton from Double Springs, Alabama, will be with us February 25th through March 1st. There is advertising material and cards out in the foyer, so pick those up and plan to participate. And do keep our brother David Gulledge in your prayers. He'll be leaving tomorrow for Little Rock headed ultimately to, I believe it's Monterrey in Mexico for a three-day relationship seminar down there in conjunction with Brother Wayne Brewer. Elders, do you have any other announcements we need to pass along before we begin? If not, then take a book and let's all sing together. Number 200 sing all three verses number 200 if you're willing and able please stand <clears throat> Praise him, oh ye heavens, 
almost forgot how to get back to church. But uh, I'm going to thank each one that called and sent a uh, card. It's, they, they really upbuilt you. And you know, when you've been sick, I believe I can cope with those that are sick now. When you go to visiting, you know, if you feel good, you really don't sympathize that much with the person. But then when you go through with it, then you, you know pain is pain. <laughs> so thank you very much. Let us pray. A great and almighty Heavenly Father, we come to you at this time thanking you, Father, for your great love. We know that you loved us so much, Father, that you sent your only son to die for us, Father. Thank you so much. You bless us for so many times each day that we live on earth that we take for granted. But thank you, Father. Father, we come to you thinking of those that suffer now with sickness, that you'll be near and dear to them, Father, that their good health might be restored back to them. We pray for special prayer for Brenda. You continue to be with her as she recuperates from the liver transplant. We're thankful, Father, for your... Thank you, Father, for being with us each day that we live on this earth. Help us to draw closer to you, Father, and realize how great you are to us and how wonderful you are in giving us everything that we need in this life. Thank you for the family here at Fayetteville, Father. We pray that you will bless each one in a special way that will make them, encourage them to be more faithful. Father, we pray for our men and women that serve in, in armed forces, that you be with them, Father. Give them safe, safety at this time and, and maybe before long that they can come home and be with their loved ones. Father, be with those that's traveling. Be with David tomorrow as he travels. Just grant him a safe trip, Father, and good result from the mission. Father, we pray now that you be with us as we uh, go to the rest of the service. We pray, Father, that anyone here that might need to hear your word will hear it, Father, and realize that they need to obey it because, Father, this might be the last day that they'll have the opportunity. Father, we pray now that you be with us and forgive us of our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Number 282. 282. We'll sing all four verses. I know that my Redeemer lives in ever praise for me. I know eternal life he gives from sin and sorrow free. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know, I know eternal life he gives 
tonight's invitation song will be number 272. Number 272. But before our lesson, we're going to sing number 217. 217, we're going to sing all three verses. <coughs> Why did the Savior heaven leave and come to earth be? think about the course of years that a gospel evangelist or a gospel preacher spends preaching and teaching, you've got to consider the wide variety of biblical matter that is addressed and oftentimes covered. And in preaching, whenever you and I turn to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 8, several times there is a phrase that simply states, and he preached Jesus unto them. One such occasion is in Acts chapter 8 and verse 35, when Philip was there with the Ethiopian eunuch. And in verse 35 it says that Philip preached Christ unto him. And so whenever you and I think about that idea of preaching Christ, it really includes a lot of different topics, a lot of different subjects. I mean, how do you preach Christ to somebody without preaching the Old Testament? How do you preach Christ without preaching about the church? How do you preach Christ without preaching about the resurrection and the death and the life? I mean, how do you preach Christ without covering so many different areas of the Bible, really the entire Bible. And so a preacher will cover a variety of lessons in his preaching. And it is not possible to treat every area or subject that might need to be heard by everybody. 
And so we might preach hard from a preacher's standpoint. We might preach hard on a vital thing that one or more individuals need to hear. And it just so happens that that individual is not there at the time that that lesson is preached. But then the pulpit and the preacher, it, it, the pulpit resounds with countless lessons that have been preached throughout the years, and over time, they've gone their way and they've been forgotten. And so the preacher, what I want to get across to you as we begin is that I and Dave and other preachers, we do our best to cover an array of of topics, to cover various subjects like Dave addressed this morning on being in your place. And sometimes the preacher needs to cover hard lessons like church attendance, as Dave did this morning. And as people don't want to hear that, it needs to be preached. And so some lessons are harder to hear, and as a preacher, some are harder to preach. But then others might be easier and more encouraging. But preaching involves so many different themes and lessons and subjects. And oftentimes, an individual might go to the preacher and ask, can you preach on such and such? Can, can you cover that? You know, I've really been thinking about this lately, and I was wondering, can you preach on that? Now, side note, I'm not saying don't do that. If you want to hear a sermon on a certain subject, Dave and I would love to oblige. But Dave and I can't feed you everything that you need to learn throughout your spiritual life. Now, sometimes we might go to the preacher and say, will you cover this subject, okay? But I want you to notice what Jesus said on three occasions as Jesus actually gave his audience, and oftentimes that audience was his critics, he actually gave them homework. And instead of telling them the answer to their question directly, sometimes he sent them off to study it themselves. And our Lord would often ask the question, when have you read your Bible? Or Jesus would repeatedly phrase the question, have you not read the Scriptures? Here you are asking me this question. You're trying to test me, I know. You're trying to trap me, I know. Have you not read the Bible yourself? And Jesus would even vary this question. In Matthew 21, take note, in verse 16, and said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said unto them, here's one way Jesus said it, yes, have you never read? But then we turn to Mark. Mark has it another way, and this is another occasion. Then he taught, saying to them, Is it not written? Don't you know what the Scriptures say? He's talking to the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, individuals that really should have, by public appearance, known what the old law said, outward appearance, but their understanding of the scripture was, was very minimal, and so they should have known it. And so Jesus would oftentimes say the question, don't you know what it says? Tonight I want to notice when Jesus actually gave homework to his audience. And at least on the first account that we will notice, Jesus actually tells them to go and learn what it means. Go study it. Go dig deeper into the old law and you come back and understand what this means. 
I know nobody likes homework. Well, there's some people out there that might like homework, and they're just weird. But generally speaking, people don't like homework. I know. I never liked homework, but I did it. And I passed my classes. And so Jesus says, and, and that's not to imply that we shouldn't like reading the Bible. That's not to imply that. But Jesus will actually give homework. Notice three occasions. We're going to go through these three tonight. They're all in the book of Matthew. So if you have your Bible, turn to the book of Matthew. We're going to notice three times where our Lord gave homework. And hopefully walk away with maybe the action and the desire to individually go and study the Word of God ourselves. The first account is in Matthew chapter 9, and for our young adults that are here tonight, this is what we studied this morning in Bible class, and that is why I'm preaching this sermon tonight. This was what we studied in Bible class this morning, Matthew chapter 9. We're studying a book entitled, Why Did My Savior Come to Earth?, and in Matthew chapter 9, Jesus is going to say the statement that I came not to call the righteous, but the sinners to repent. But we were in Matthew 9, 12 and 13, and so I was like, well, okay, tonight I'm going to go to Matthew 9 and then other passages, and we're going to look at, at, at this lesson. So this is what we studied this morning. But Matthew chapter 9, Jesus is going to be criticized again by his critics they're always there. They're always criticizing the works of Jesus. And they're going to test him. And in Matthew chapter 9, verses 12 and 13, Jesus says, when Jesus heard that, and so the context, Jesus is here. If you start in verse 9, Jesus is there with Matthew. He goes to Matthew's house. He eats a meal with Matthew and other tax collectors and sinners and there he is eating this meal. And so his critics, the Pharisees, they see it. They ask the disciples, verse uh, 11, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? All right, now verse 12. When Jesus heard that, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You Pharisees, you don't know what you're talking about. You might know what the law says, but you don't understand what the law says. So, you're criticizing me for eating with publicans and sinners and tax collectors. Go learn what the law actually says. And this is actually the first of second times that Jesus says this. The second is actually in Matthew chapter 12. So, three chapters later, in Matthew 12... Verse 7 and 8. Jesus said, But if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. And so maybe on this second occasion in Matthew 12, Jesus is remembering the first occasion where he gave that homework. In Matthew 9, he says, Go learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Matthew 12, on the second occasion, he says, if you had only understood what this means. And so maybe he's thanking the fact that I've already told you to go learn it. I gave you the homework to go study and to understand. And so two times, Jesus is going to make reference to the mercy and not sacrifice. Now, this is a direct quote out of Hosea 6 and verse 6. Well, where Hosea records that the Lord desires mercy and not sacrifice. And so people offered sacrifices, but they had forgotten that these sacrifices were to express their attitudes towards God. They were going through the motion, but they were not emotionally in the sacrifice. They were going through the actions, but their heart was so far from God, and their heart was corrupt. And so God doesn't care about the actions if the heart is not in it as well. 
And so God desires mercy and not sacrifice. You can offer the burnt offering, you can offer the sacrifice, but then you turn around and you go and corrupt and live a corrupt life and you live immorally, then God doesn't care about your sacrifice. He cares about mercy and not sacrifice. Go learn what this means, Jesus tells the Pharisees. Sacrifices should have reminded them of God's mercy. The Sabbath day, in Matthew chapter 12, the reason why Jesus said it a second time is because, again, they were criticizing Jesus because Jesus and the disciples were walking through a wheat field on the Sabbath. They were hungry. They, they began to pick some food to eat, and they were eating it, and they were criticized for eating and working on the Sabbath in Matthew 12. And that's why they were criticized, and Jesus then says... If you had only understood what this means. And so the Sabbath day should have reminded them of spiritual things. But they were so caught up in the action that they forgot why it was established in the first place. Let me bring it to us today. Let me make application to us. Mercy and not sacrifice is still a lesson that we need to learn today. Because you see, Jesus did not mean that worship is not a major focus of our life. He didn't mean that. In John 4 and verse 24, God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And so, obviously, worship is a part of our life. But if you come to worship... As Dave talked about this morning, you don't come to church, you come to worship. But if you come to worship and you go through the motions, you sit in the pew and all you are is a bench warmer, you sing the songs, your lips move, you may be given the offering plate, you partake of the, the Lord's Supper, you listen to the sermon, maybe you take notes, you go through the actions, but then you depart and you leave and you live as though you're not following Christ, you live immorally you live with your heart so far away from God you're going through the motions but there's no mercy there, 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 there's there's sacrifice but no mercy and so religion and worship should remind us of our sin and Make us appreciate God's mercy, Luke chapter 8, 9 through 14. And so when they criticized Jesus for eating with tax collectors and sinners, Jesus said, go learn what this means. You go study it. You might be able to quote it, but you don't understand it. Then in Matthew 12, he says it again. If you had only understood, if only you'd done your homework, you'd know what this means. That God desires mercy and not sacrifice. You see, the two really need to come together. You need to have a life of service and a heart committed to God. You need the mercy of God. You need to be a merciful person. You need to be committed, but you also need to be an individual that sacrifices. You need to be an individual that worships as well. Bring them together. But then we turn to Matthew chapter 19. And Jesus is going to give a... a second occasion of homework or he's going to ask them the question have you not read do you not understand what is being said in Matthew chapter 19 he is continuing his ministry and again he meets with the Pharisees the Pharisees this time in Matthew 19 they're going to question him about marriage and divorce in Matthew 19, 1 through 3, Now it came to pass, when Jesus had finished these sayings, that he departed from Galilee and came to the region of Judea, beyond the Jordan, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. Then the Pharisees also came to him, testing him, and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason? And so they come to Jesus, and they ask him a question about divorce. Now, if we were to turn back to Deuteronomy 24 and verse 1, 
Deuteronomy 24, 1 tells us that a man can put away his wife for uncleanness. Now, there were some individuals that interpreted that word and that commandment of uncleanness. Some understood it as sexual immorality, and then others understood it as any form of uncleanness. If your wife cooked you breakfast and she burnt the toast, that's grounds to divorce her. And it was really any means of divorce. And so they come to Jesus. Can a man divorce his wife for any reason? They're testing him to see what he's going to say in response. And so a great lesson from Genesis was in order. And so he's going to go back to the very beginning. In verses 4 through 6. And he said and answered unto them, Have you not read? Here's your homework. Have you not studied and have you not read from the law that he that made them, have you not read that he who made them in the beginning made them male and female? Have you not turned to the book of Genesis and read that? He that made them in the, in the beginning made them male and female and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Have you not read that, Pharisees? I believe they had. But they didn't understand it. Or they were testing the Lord. Have you not read this? Verse 6. So then... You are, are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. And so here's a second occasion where the Lord asks that question. Have you not read this? Have you not done your homework? This time it was with reference to marriage. And, and Jesus would go on in verse 9 to allow one exception for the divorce and remarriage in verse 9, and that was unfaithfulness or sexual immorality or adultery, the unfaithfulness of a spouse. When this takes place, then the faithful individual, the faithful partner has grounds for divorce and remarriage. You don't have to divorce them, but you have the grounds because of the unfaithfulness of your partner. That's God's standard. But there's the question, can a man divorce his wife for any reason? Jesus says, have you not read? It is not that these Pharisees were unfamiliar with God's intent for the home. They were really just testing the Lord. And his response, you know what the law says, or have you not read it at all? But let's think about the home today. When you and I look at the home, it really is in trouble. The home, the American home today, in fact, I read a statistic a few weeks ago that said 50%, 50% of first marriages end in divorce. 67% of second marriages end in divorce, and 74% of third marriages end in divorce. Our homes are broken. Marriages are not standing like God intended them to stand. They are dividing. Our homes are divided. Our homes are broken. Our homes are in trouble. The grass is not greener on the other side. The American home is disintegrating. Many of us know this perhaps firsthand. Maybe we've experienced a broken home. But so deep is cultural depravity that we cannot even see the basic design for marriage anymore. As we look at the country and the culture around us, we see that the agenda for same-sex marriages are being pushed and thrown at us. Individuals are living together outside of wedlock. And you see the home as God designed it. It's almost a rare thing to be seen anymore. But when they came to Jesus, 
and they questioned him about marriage and divorce, Jesus says, have you not read? But then we turn to a third occasion. And we go to Matthew chapter 22. This time it wasn't the Pharisees, it's the Sadducees. And the Sadducees, they come to Jesus asking him another question. And we're going to start in verse 23. The same day the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him and asked him, saying, Teacher, Moses said that if a man dies having no children, this brother shall marry his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were with us seven brothers. The first died after he had married, and having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. Likewise, the second also, and the third, even to the seventh. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, which the Sadducees don't even believe in, In the resurrection, whose wife of the seven shall she be? For they all had her. So here's the Sadducees' question. Seven men married to the same woman in the law of Moses. Deuteronomy chapter 25 is where we read about if a man is married to a woman and he dies having no children, the brother marries the wife and has children for that husband that died. And it continues on. And here's an occasion that the the Sadducees bring up. That seven brothers, the husband keeps dying, the next brother comes in. The husband dies, the next brother comes in. Seven times. Whose husband will she, or whose wife will she be in the resurrection? Deuteronomy chapter 25. And so they're actually bringing up the law of Moses. But this is what Jesus said. Verse 29. Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels of God in heaven. Now there's his first response. Notice verse 29. You're mistaken and you don't know the scriptures. That's his first response or the first part of his response. But then notice verse 31. But concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God, saying, I am a God, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the multitudes heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. And so here's the Sadducees, and they come and they present Jesus with the scenario, seven men, one wife, whose is she in the resurrection? They didn't even believe in the resurrection, but they're testing the Lord and seeing what he will say. But then he says, you're mistaken. Haven't you read in the old law? Well, apparently they have. They've read Deuteronomy chapter 25, but they've misunderstood it and they've misapplied it because then Jesus tells them that in the resurrection, it will not be a physical resurrection, but a spiritual resurrection. And when this resurrection takes place, they will be as the angels, and the angels are not given in marriage, neither do they marry. And that is what's going to take place in the resurrection. Have you not read this? Well, they had, but they had simply drawn a false conclusion from what they had read. And so then Jesus is going to do something. He's going to correct them. He's going to take them to another book and another passage written by Moses, and he's going to correct their thinking. They are going to Deuteronomy 25. And if you read Deuteronomy 25, it really reads almost the same. If a man is married to a wife and he dies, I mean, that's Deuteronomy 25. That's where they go. Jesus is now going to go to Exodus 3 and verse 6. And in Exodus 3 and verse 6, 
is where Jesus quotes, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. It's not a physical resurrection, it's a spiritual resurrection, and you don't understand what it means. You don't understand the power of God. You think that there's not going to be a resurrection, but God is so powerful and you don't understand it that he's going to raise people from the dead. He's going to make them into spirits like the angels and they are, never, they are not given in marriage, neither do they marry. You don't understand the power of God. You don't understand the God of the living. But he says, have you not... Read. Do you not understand? And so three times, Jesus gives homework, really to his critics, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, who came to Jesus questioning him and testing him. And his simple response was, you need to go and you need to study this. You need to read this. You need to understand this. Don't leave it up to me to tell you everything you need to know. You go study it and understand it. Well, as we close our thoughts, I want to think about a man who did his homework. And we find this man in Acts chapter 8. He had traveled hundreds of miles to Jerusalem. And he's going by way of a chariot. And as far as we know, he's by himself. The text doesn't indicate anyone else was with him. But by the providence of God and, well, direct communication, Philip is sent to this man. But when we turn to Acts chapter 8, we read that this man is actually reading from Isaiah chapter 53. You see, he's doing his homework. He's reading the Word of God. He's studying it. He doesn't necessarily understand what it means and what it's saying, and that's why Philip comes and assists him in the study. But here's an Ethiopian eunuch who is reading and studying the Word of God. And as you read the homework, the studying leads the eunuch to being converted. He studies and he reads and he studies and he reads and Philip comes and he sits with the eunuch and he studies and he reads and he does his homework and he realizes what he needs to do to become a child of God and he calls himself and says, hey, here's water, what hinders me from being baptized? Philip said, if you believe and understand with all your heart, you may, and he says, I do, They went down into the water, they were baptized. You see, the Ethiopian eunuch did his homework. He read the scriptures, he studied it, and he applied it. So there were three times where Jesus gave homework to his critics, and we we turn to Acts chapter 8, and we learn a lot from the Ethiopian eunuch. And so the lesson that I want us to take away tonight is to simply be the type of person that studies the Word of God. Read it. Study it. Dig down deep into it so that you don't misapply it, so that you don't misunderstand it. And don't simply rely on what other people teach you to be the sole foundation of everything that you study in Scripture. Do your homework. The invitation tonight is yours. If you're not a child of God, you can become one. As we study the Word of God, we see what it says for us to do to to repent of our sins and to make that confession and to be baptized, and then we're added to the Lord's body. And if you are in the same situation as the Ethiopian eunuch where you realize what you need to do, you can do that tonight and be added to the Lord's church, but maybe you are 
a child of God and maybe you've wandered away, well, the scriptures also teach that you can return. Maybe you're like the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15 and you've gone away and you're living an unfaithful life and you just simply need to come back home. Well, you can do that as well. And so tonight the invitation is yours. Whatever we can assist you with, will you come as together we stand and we sing. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, I still will follow. evening the uh, Lord's Supper has been left prepared for those that may have been unable to partake of it this morning. If you would turn to number 511, 511, we will sing verses 2 and 3. And while we sing those verses, if you haven't partaken, come forward and it's at the end of the song you will be served. Verses 2 and 3. May we keep in memory.
as we close tonight, let's uh, turn to number 473. 473, uh, we'll sing all three verses. But uh, just remember in your prayers, those that have had surgery that is recovering, uh, Sister Brenda and Brother Paul. Also, remember those that have procedures coming up and uh, those that have the flu, like so many have already had with us. Um, remember, we come back uh, Tuesday morning at uh, 10, I believe, for uh, adult Bible study. And then we have uh, at 7 on Wednesday, we have our midweek uh, Bible study. So if you would, let's stand. We'll sing all three verses, and then we'll be closed with a prayer. There is a name I love to hear, I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. It tells me a Savior's love who died to set me free. It tells me of his precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me, it tells of one whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe, who in each sorrow bears a part that none can bear. pray with me. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We come to you tonight, Father, thanking you for all your many blessings, thanking you most of all for your son, Jesus. We thank you, Father, that we have had many successful operations and people recovering from these operations, and we know that your hand was involved. We ask you now, Father, to be with those that have upcoming operations and those that are ill. We need them back whole to worship you. We thank you this evening, Father, for our preacher and our youth minister. We ask you to be with David as he goes to Mexico, keep him safe, and bring him back to us. We ask you, Father, to go with us now as we leave this place of worship to our separate homes. Guide, guard, and direct us, and forgive us of our sins, for we pray in Christ's name. Amen. <laughs>